everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Uncommon Comedy Podcast. I am your host, Brian April. And for the regular viewers, yes, you can see I am rocking my quarantine buzz cut. Uh, basically shaved my head uh, because why not? I'm not going anywhere. So um, as always, so this these uh, episodes are available to listen to on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and on Spotify. If you want to watch the video versions, you can check us out on Facebook and or YouTube. And if you have any questions or comments about the episodes, please feel free to leave them in the comments below, uh, or you can reach out to me. I am on youtube.com slash comedy Brian, facebook.com slash comedy Brian, and three days a week I live stream on Twitch if you want to interact with me live, uh, twitch.tv slash comedy Brian. So we're going to get right into it today. Uh, my guest, I'm actually really excited about my guest today. Uh, this is a little different. Normally, uh, the comedians that I have on the show, I have a, a long history with them. We've done tons of shows with them. Uh, this this comedian, uh, this is actually the first time I'll be speaking with him. Uh, we've communicated a little bit over uh, email. I was listening to uh, Sirius XM in the car a couple years ago, and uh, this clip of this comedian came on, and I laughed so hard. It was so funny, and I had to like look and figure out exactly who this was to make sure that I could uh, look him up because it was, it was just amazing stuff that I, I really, really enjoyed. And so uh, I found uh, found out his name. I reached out to him and I just said, "Hey, man, I think you're amazing. Just uh, you are going to be a household name uh, in no time." And uh, I'm like I said, talked to him a little bit back and forth, and finally we got a chance to connect today. And I'm excited to hear his story and hear how he thinks a little bit and get to talk to the man. So please welcome the extremely funny Mr. Harris Anderson. Harris, how are you, sir? I'm very well, Brian. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Um, uh, like I said, I, I, I'm, I'm really excited to have you on today. Um, most of the time, like I said, I, I know the people, um, and I always like to start off by saying what I, what I like about a, a person's act. And I just remember hearing your act. I believe it was your, um, JFL just for laughs, uh, set, uh, I, I don't know if it was an audition set or at JFL. Um, and it was just extremely funny and I'd love the characters that you come in out of, the, the voices, the way you use your voice, um, your physicality on stage is really funny, and the topics that you do uh, are really funny. I mean, you have a, a joke about jazz that just made me laugh out loud. You have the, the whole thing about the board games, which is hysterical, and then you also take in um, some topics uh, about gun control, um, you know, at least in America, which is a, a big deal. And um, you do it in a way that's very funny and nonpartisan and um, doesn't necessarily uh, anger anybody. And uh, I sense I heard, and I, I wanted to ask you this, I heard a little uh, Die Hard references in there. Is that uh, where you came up with some of those names? Yeah, Hans Gruber snuck in there, but I separated yeah. <laughs> and last names. Uh, that's, I was, I'm so flattered, Brian. That's, 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 that's a very kind thing to say. I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I'm a big admirer of yours too. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, we, uh, my wife and I were just like, we have to see this. And I think originally when we saw it, it just said uh, Harris Anders because my Sirius XM cut off. So we were looking for Harris Anders, and then <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> this guy doesn't exist. So yeah, uh, he's, on, he's on the East Coast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. A, a rivalry going. <laughs> so. Um, so let's talk a little bit about you. Um, tell us uh, about um, who or what start inspired you to start uh, performing. Well, uh, when I was a, a kid, Jim Carrey was the biggest guy on the planet. He was a rock star. And uh, I just remember watching those movies and just being just utterly enthralled with, with what he was doing. And then when I got a little older, um, this thing called the Comedy Network premiered in Canada, which is like your guys' version of Comedy Central. Okay. And they would, they would show uh, highlights from the Just for Laughs Festival. That came on every day at about 3.30. So I, right after school, I would run home and I would just watch all these clips from the Montreal Comedy Festival with all these different people and all these comedians that I eventually became some of my favorite comedians, like Brian Regan, you mentioned. Brian, mm -hmm. Brian Regan's my number one guy, Maria Bamford, Lee Evans, Pablo Francisco, all these, all these people that, um, so I, I got the bug then I think. And, um, around 12 years old, I said, I really want to try stand up comedy, but I didn't work up the courage until I was 23. It took me about, um, I think that's 11 years. 
<laughs> it took me 11 years to, to work up the nerve to actually try it after that. But uh, ever since then, it's been uh, the main focus of my life, I would say. Yeah. And uh, how long have you been performing? Just so we have a, a gauge. Not counting uh, the COVID time, I'd say about eight years. Okay. I saw, it's been about eight years now. Yeah. Nice. Nice. So you uh, you said uh, Maria Bamford. I love Maria Bamford. is is amazing. Uh, she's so amazing oh. with how she just uses her voice and, and changes and. Yeah, and I, you know, I think you mentioned. Um, well, we, we we both kind of use our voices. I mean, you do impressions mm -hmm. and everything else, and um, I I appreciate Maria Bamford so much, just from a technical standpoint, just what she's able to do with her voice how she's able to create different characters just on stage alone. Same with her and Pablo Francisco, I think. Mm -hmm. Those two, in terms of their vo of their vocal ability, are two of the best, or two of the most talented technicians to ever get behind a mic. Just what they can do is unbelievable. And I've always been attracted to that kind of approach of playing around with, with physicality and voices and, and characters and things like that. Yeah, yeah, and now that you mentioned, um, uh, for we were talking before we started, and I, I said that to me, you remind me of a, a mixture of um, Brian Regan, Jim Gaffigan, and uh, early Dane Cook. Uh, but I can I'll totally see, yeah, I can totally see the the Jim Carrey, you know. Um, uh, and yeah. again, you're you're your own person. I'm not saying that you're you're doing that, but I can see how those influences. Um, so sure. I'm not saying that you see their act, but I'm just saying I can see how that could yeah. be an influence on you uh, especially yeah, with the you know use your words caleb and you know that's that's <laughs> something that i could totally see uh uh being done so um it's it's so interesting though uh do you get any grief for the uh like messing around with voices because i know for me sometimes i get grief because oh you do voices you're a hack and whatever and i just think it's nonsense i think it's people just being <laughs> that they, they can't do that or is that do you get a yeah, lot of I don't think, I I you I mean I get I get ribbing from my friends and things like that but it's all good natured but okay. um, in the in, in the beginning definitely more you get people that say you know you do your set and people say uh, oh that was fun like uh, <laughs> as as in uh, that had no comedic value but it was it was a nice little interlude I guess <laughs> but but the way I look at it is that um I would say that Bill Burr right now is kind of a comics comic. He's one of the most mm -hmm. popular comics in the world, and he's respected by comics everywhere. Incredibly physical performer, and also um, a much wider array of characters and voices than people give him him credit for. Uh, you know, I've, I've 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 only really become an admirer of his in the last few years, but he's. I mean, what what he does with the mic stand is 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 incredible. He he uses the whole stage. He's he's a performer. He's the total package. So when people say, "Oh, give you <laughs> grief for using your voice," that's that's your main instrument as a, a comic. So right, you're just exploring the full the reaches of your instrument. Not to say yeah. that I don't think you're. Not to say that I don't think that you're doing comedy wrong if you don't do <laughs> strange voices or impersonations. But to, to give to give comics grief for playing around with those sorts of things, it seems doesn't it, the argument doesn't hold water for me yeah i think there's just a lot of um I, th I think comedy can be a very bitter and um jaded experience and people just take it out on you know their, their insecurities their failures or whatever and they just try to project it onto you and you mm -hmm. have to do this path and uh, yeah. i think when you do that you just end up being just another version of something that's come before you just be you you know yeah, do what makes you happy. It, what's what's the point in in doing a, a version of what some people think you should be? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Would you say? Uh, well, I mean, you, your impressions are very popular. It's obviously a, a big a selling point in your acts. Mm -hmm. What what percentage of your acts would you say is is impressions? It's actually not nearly as much as people would think. It's um, I use impressions more to flavor the joke or to flavor the yeah. bit. Uh, I'm not doing a, um, 
you know, I'm not doing Pablo Francisco, uh, Little Tortilla Boy or The Tortillanator. I'm not doing um, Frank Caliendo's Madden or, or anything like that. I will just <clears throat> come in with a bit and say, oh, I felt like, you know, Homer. And then boom, just do a line or two and then out. Um, so it's it's just more of a way to uh, enhance a punchline or tag it. So it's a, I, I think it's a very small the, the, I guess the percentage of jokes that I have that have impressions is is probably pretty high, but the amount of impressions overall is isn't uh, isn't right. very it, high. You know what I mean? The the number of words it, that I it's in your arsenal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there are a couple of things that I'll do that are are, are specific things, like I'll do a thing about um, Alan Rickman as the voice of Alexa or whatever. So like that that bit is much more of a, a voice centric thing, but for the most part, I just try to come in and out with a couple lines just for enough people to pop and then just kind of go back into another, you know, joke. Of course. So yeah. it's, it's a weird percentage to, to try to figure out. Uh -huh. um, so so let me ask you uh, this. Do you remember your first show? Yes, I do. It was at the uh, Victoria Event Center in Victoria, British Columbia. Uh, I finally worked up the nerve to go to a comedy night. It was hosted by a very funny guy named uh, Wes Borg. And uh, I brought along my girlfriend at the time and some friends from the college I was going to. And uh, it was definitely nerve wracking. I'd, I'd done theater before that. I'd been in amateur theater, musicals, stuff like that. But it, it felt totally different. And uh, that caught me off guard. I, I, I wasn't going into it arrogant definitely but i thought well i've been on stage and this is a stage but it felt completely different and um which i liked i thought it was so i thought well, what a what a delicious challenge this is this is so <laughs> you know this is something i can really stick my teeth into and then shortly after you know about a year and a half later i transitioned from i stopped doing live theater and just put all my attention into comedy it just felt like a better fit for me mm. Yeah, so I remember my first show pretty vividly. I Didn't was lucky well. that it, it went okay, which I'm thankful for because <laughs> you know you, you you hear comics talk about their first show and they say, "Oh, I was so nervous and I was horrible and the crowd hated me." And if I'd had an experience like that, I I don't know if I would necessarily have had the strength of character to try it again. Mm. Um, I'd like to think that I, I would, but I, I don't know. <laughs> So, but I was very lucky that I had that support system and my first time went okay. I didn't get a standing ovation or anything, but there wasn't as much embarrassed silence as I thought there would be. Right. So I was very fortunate, I think. And it's it's funny how quickly you get hooked on that laughter. You know, you get yeah. you get even even if it's one laugh early on, you're like, I need more of that. Absolutely. And, uh, and it just makes you go through this this gauntlet of just terrible shows and you know in the beginning and all these weird locations and venues and you'll you'll do whatever just to try to get out and get that laugh and it's, it, it's yeah so funny. it is we're all we're all chasing that that one night and every i don't know 100 shows where just everything goes right and just your your brain is just firing on all cylinders and it feels like everything that comes out of your mouth is funny and then the next hundred shows are horrible. <laughs> and, um, but I, I rationalize it by saying that the good nights are worth the bad nights. The good oh, nights absolutely. are just supply. Yeah, absolutely. That, that one amazing show makes up yeah. for the 99 trash ones before it. So, and, absolutely. and then you start to kind of, uh, you start to kind of understand it a little bit. You start to learn the psychology of it. You start to learn the, the, the tips and tricks and, and it starts to kind of even out and things kind of click for you. And then so at what point did that happen for you? Did things start to, to click? Well, I don't know if they have fully or not. I, <laughs> I, um, I still think I, I still think I'm still, I think I'm still learning really. And um, it definitely, there definitely became, I'd say there was a period where I was bombing what felt like every single show mm -hmm. for about six months or so this was like i guess in my third or maybe first or second year within that time fairly early on that i was bombing almost constantly and then i realized that well i think part of the reason i'm bombing is that 
I'm thinking about bombing before I've even gotten on stage and I'm approaching, literally approaching the stage from the, from the, from the, um, with dread in mind. <laughs> and I thought, well, let's, we've run, we've, run, we've run that experiment and that hasn't worked out too well. So why don't we, why don't I try doing it from a place of excitement and saying, okay, well, let's get on stage and just try it and just throw the spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks. And that worked out a lot better for me. Once I, once I started thinking about it, of it, thinking about my time on stage as an opportunity rather than a gauntlet where I was just constantly dodging embarrassment or, or, or indignity, whatever, that was, that was kind of a turning point. And then I became more comfortable on stage, a little bit more comfortable. Yeah, I think that's a really important thing that you, you say. It's it's a, one of those human psychological um, things that, you know, they, they have those tests where they say, okay, look around your room and notice everything blue. And then close your eyes and now tell me everything that's red. And so it's that perception of what you're you're looking for. And most people can't do it because they were only focusing on the blue. So if you go up there with that perception of like, yeah, this is terrible and I don't want a bomb and I don't want this, you're, 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 if something doesn't go well or doesn't hit as well, you immediately go, oh no, don't start bombing. Am I going to bomb? You know, and you start getting in that, that rut on stage. Whereas if you said you go at it with excitement and what can I deliver and what can, what can we do that's fun? Even if something doesn't hit as well, you go, all right, that didn't hit. Well, this next one is going to be good. And I think having that, that mind frame is, is such an important aspect of, of building that, uh, that comfortability on stage and just, uh, mm -hmm. looking at it from that perception is, is so important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that uh, the audiences are, the audience as a whole is quite an intuitive creature actually. And, and if they sense that someone is scared, then they're less likely to laugh because they, they can't feel it. They can relax with that person. Whereas right. if someone is on stage with, it can be loose and can have a joke, not go well and just laugh it off or just make fun of themselves or just acknowledge that something awkward just happened. They feel a lot safer. They, oh, it's okay. We'll get, we'll get through. We'll get yeah, through. absolutely. Absolutely. They, they totally can sense that and they will mirror whatever, whatever energy you bring up there. So if you bring up like a, Hey, we're going to have fun. And even though you may not be the funniest guy, if you're still having fun and uh, you know, being entertaining and you know, your personality is a, a positive thing, they're going to like you. You know, they may not, uh, like I said, laugh at everything, but if you just go up there and you're like, this is going to suck, then they're going to totally pick up on that. So uh, mm -hmm. they will mirror whatever you, you give them. It's so, yeah. so true. Um, what is the uh, best advice that you received about comedy or performing? Well, I think the best advice was actually more of encouragement. Um, I, I asked, like, there was a, a a comic that I admired and still greatly admire named Ivan Decker. He's just kind of making his way into the States now, but uh, I, you know, he, he was, and is kind of the gold standard in Vancouver. And uh, he, he at a show I saw, I went up to him after a show and said, like, can you give me some advice or whatever? And he said, just keep doing what you're doing. And I realized that he did me a great service. Cause I'm sure there's things in my act that he could have said, well, I think you should do this better or you should do, try this instead, or you should say this instead of this. But I think that's actually, um, that can be quite harmful. And um, so I think the best advice is to, that one of the best pieces of advice I received is don't really take advice on your material because you can be talked out of something that actually might be a perfect fit for you. And it's, right. ha it's happened to me as well, where, if, you know, the comics have said, oh, I don't like this bit at all. Why are you doing this? This bit's lame or whatever. And even if I've just done it on stage and it's been received pretty well. So that's something in, we all have our biases too. I, I've caught myself doing it. You know, if, if someone who's just started comes up to me and says, do you have any advice or whatever, you know, and I was, oh, and I'm sometimes tempted to say, well, you should try this something. And then I kind of have to just stop myself because that's not helping the person at all. You just kind of have to be true to yourself, I guess, and listen to in terms of in terms of practical advice, there's one piece of practical advice that I would pass on to, to anyone else, which is that uh, in this this uh, Canadian comic Mike McDonald gave me this advice, and he said record everything, 
not your not just your sets, but your any ideas you think you might have, even if no matter how small it is, record it. Say it into your your phone or a tape or a tape machine or write it down, but record everything because it, it takes a second to do, but it could turn into something huge. And uh, I followed that ever since, and I would, wouldn't hesitate to recommend that to another comic. Just I keep I'm very religious about record not editing my ideas as they come to me. If something says to me like, oh, dogs wearing hats, I'll just say into my phone, dogs wearing hats, even though it'll probably turn out to be nothing. Right. <laughs> but it might turn out to be something. So it's just it's a small investment that can turn out to be something big. Yeah, so, that's really good advice. I, yeah, I was I was that was a turning point when I got that advice, I would say. <laughs> and yeah, I, that's a practice I've adopted. <laughs> That's that's really good advice. Yeah, you, I, my phone is full of just notes, and I just go, okay. <laughs> and you just look at it, you go back and go, yeah. what are you even thinking with this? But And then sometimes you'll, oh, this worked perfectly. Yeah. I look, about, I look at it as kind of filling the pantry, right? When you go to write, it's kind of like when you're hungry and you get, you're going to get a snack. And if you open your pantry and there's nothing in there, it's very disheartening. I'm hungry. Right. And there's nothing in there. But if you fill it with little things, even if they're just little tidbits, like snacks and things like that, little <laughs> ideas, one-liners, tags, anything, then when you go to write, then you have lots to choose from. All these little things can be expanded into larger things. Hmm. And then, yeah, today you just go, yeah, today I feel like uh, dogs with hats. and Exactly. Oh, dogs with hats is, is sitting there. <laughs> That's perfect. And, and, and then you're all, you're all set, yeah. So what is um what is the the rest of your writing process like? Well, I see, I haven't I haven't written a lot in the last I haven't actually performed in five months. You know I know it's crazy. Of, it's a horrible epidemic, but um, hopefully soon I'll get back into it. But usually when I write, I, I I sit down with my notebook and I have my my phone, which is where I record all my little ideas, and then I write. I I usually end up writing quite long bits, usually like three or so pages. And then uh, I'll go and try it out. And maybe if I'm lucky, one or two lines or one or two parts of it work. Mm -hmm. And then I just, I throw out what doesn't work. And then I just go in the direction of whatever's, whatever's working. Sometimes you hit the lottery and a bit that you had in your head goes on the page and then translates perfectly onto the stage. It's so rare. It's so I don't know what it, what it's like for you, but for me, it's that's so rare when that happens. It's like a unicorn sighting. But um, yeah, that's that's basically my process. Is I try to just I try to write as much as I can and throw as much of it on the stage, and then whatever sticks, uh, I go for that. Yeah, I think uh, also as you as you do comedy longer uh, and you get you know the more you do it, and it doesn't matter if it's it's eight years or twenty three years in my case or whatever. Uh, you start to learn your voice and you start to learn kind of how you deliver things and you start to have this back, you know, catalog of, of knowledge of, okay, when I do this joke, this works. And when I say the words this way or punchlines this way, it works. And when I do this, it doesn't. And so you can start to, when you're writing, go, well, let me, you know, shift it and deliver it in this sort of tone. And you start to, to for me anyway, write a little faster. So, um, Depending on when the, I, I don't bring it on stage until um, I've gone over it a few times. So I, I like to rant. I'm a ranter. So I will say something out loud and record it and then kind of go, oh, that's funny. Um, and then work backwards to, to get to the, the punchline quickly and then just say it out loud 10 times or so just to get the marbles out of my mouth. Just do the natural editing that we do when we, we talk. And then I'll write it down and then I can start to really nitpick, you know, let me move this word here. Let me, you know, shift this here. And so by the time I bring it on, usually it, it's pretty good, but I, I only will do that. I do it in small chunks. So I'll do like a uh, maybe three jokes of it. And just because I just want to make sure I don't want to go on stage with, you know, uh, two minutes of, of material and hope that. It, it all works um, because even if I have something that's good at the end and nothing else is good leading up to it, they're not going to laugh at the end at that good mm -hmm. part because they've now determined everything else is not funny. So mm -hmm. I, 
I just sit there and I'll go, okay, I'm just going to start with this basic thing right here. And I have these other things ready to tack on if they work, but I don't want to spend all this time and energy if it's not going to, you know, uh, I guess was it throw the, the baby, uh, good, throwing good money after bad or whatever that, that phrase is. So, mm -hmm. uh, so I just go, okay, I'm going to do this simple little thing here and this worked. Okay, great. Now let me expand it. So if my basic core premise isn't funny, then I won't bring in the other stuff until it is. Right. So that's kind that of my. Yeah, that's I, that seems like a very sound approach, and um, it it is hard sometimes. Your ego gets in the way when you don't want to throw something away, and you think, "Oh, this is so funny." And sometimes yeah. sometimes you have it hurts <laughs> shelving yeah. it. You think it's really funny, but I'd say that's the the number one, at least from my point of view, the number one mistake I see people making when they're early on is just trying bits that don't work the same over and and over again and. It's just kind of madness yeah. to me. It, obviously, something needs to change, and right. uh, yeah. And I and I'm not um, dismissing the the idea of right. Like if, if things are, are flowing out of you, then by all means, like write. If you can write three pages of stuff, like brilliant, that's great. Yeah. Um, but as far as putting the extra effort into it for me, anyway, like I said, I just um, you know I I write with uh, for some some comics and and. So they'll always sit there and go, well, I want to do this and this. And I go, well, let's just make sure that this part works first before we spend an hour trying to do this tag to something that's yeah. not going to work. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense, well, yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's interesting. It's, um, you were talking about seeing you know newer comics go up and um, just not changing anything. How often do you kind of let something um, – how often do you tweak something? Is it uh, you know three shows, five shows, one show that you you kind of judge? Is this funny or not? Uh, well, first time if it doesn't work, I usually chalk it up to me maybe being nervous about telling it for the first time. Uh, I might try it again on a couple of shows. Usually, if it's not working after you know maybe the third time I try it. Um, I'll usually just shelve it and just sit up yeah. I won't throw it away, but I'll shelve it. I'll say, maybe I'll come back to this later. And I'm sure you've had this experience where you, you, a bit isn't working for whatever reason, or a bit you just tried, and then you just shelve it and then you bring it yeah. back a couple of years later. And for some reason it starts to work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's a, I, which never fails to amaze me. I don't know. I don't know how it works or whatever, but yeah, uh, it's, 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 I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh no! And I was going to say that also the, the 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 opposite seems to be true. Sometimes we have a bit that's worked and worked and worked, and then one day you tell it, and it just doesn't seem to work. <laughs> you know, that's the worst. <laughs> yeah, that is the worst. Be like, why? Why is this no longer working? Yeah, yeah. You know, I had so, a, a I had a, a bit. That's <laughs> no, okay. About uh, Obama and Trump, and it was a fat. It was a fat joke. It wasn't a uh, political joke at all. And it was just using their campaign slogans uh, and twisted with you know fat, uh, and mm -hmm. it worked great. And then, I mean, it worked really, really, really well. It was one of my best jokes. And then all of a sudden, you know, with the the tensions and the Trump and all the the political starts to get closer. Everyone was just like, "We're done. We don't want to hear anything that even remotely." talks about politics and it just stopped working. And I was like, well, all right, I guess we're, we're done with that. We'll put that away now. But yeah. Yeah. I think also to touch on, on, on your point a little bit too, is, you know, going back and revisiting it's um, when we, when we start off and we have all these ideas and premises that may or may not work and we go, well, that's not funny. Um, I always encourage people to go back and look at them after they've been doing comedy a while, because your premises could still be funny. It's just you're a much better technician now or you're a much better writer or you're more comfortable on stage. So you can take that thing that was still funny to you back then and maybe you can come at it from a different angle now um, and a different approach. And so people sit there and go, oh, I used to do try to do a bit about bathwater when I was whatever and it yeah. never worked and it's just not funny. It's like, well, now you've been doing you know comedy another seven years or four years or whatever take that bathwater premise and rework it because there was something in your brain that said it was funny uh, when you initially wrote it. And now you're just more skilled and more talented. See if you can go ahead and 
do something with it now. That makes that I would totally agree with that. That's and that um, again goes back to my 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 thing about recording everything and being your own archivist. If you know if you keep records, <laughs> you yeah. know, and if you're good at organizing your material and whatever way suits you. I have friends that make spreadsheets and things like that. Um, you, know, you don't have to get that technical, but if you have something like that where you can go back and look through what you were doing, you know, four or five years ago, you, you exactly like you said, you can find something that'll work now that you have a little more authority behind you. I've had that experience for sure. Um, so here's my favorite question to ask. Um, okay. What was your worst show ever? <laughs> oh man. My worst show ever was probably, uh, this was a couple of Christmases ago. I got hired for a private Christmas party in someone's house. Uh, we show up. It's a guy who owns a, uh, a personal training studio. And uh, he says, this is the corner of the room. You'll be standing. It was me and another guy. And uh, he hand us this mic, uh, which is just a karaoke mic. You know, mm -hmm. we test it it immediately feeds back like ah! or like oh god this is gonna be horrible <laughs> and then uh he just uh he's, we were just kind of standing there and then he says uh all right everybody the strippers are here and it's like ah ha 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 but people are kind of confused because they're like are they actually strippers they they look a little sad <laughs> so he's kind of hustles everybody down to the couch and you know people are holding or or d'oeuvres and everything and <laughs> it's it's a personal training studio and almost all his employees he's the boss almost all these employees are these like gorgeous toned amazonian women and they just sit down like right up front and i just started on my act and they just look so unimpressed and it, it, these gorgeous women just looking so unimpressed and I'm like this is like high school <laughs> this feels just like grade eight all over again and then he starts heckling, he starts heckling me and i quickly realized oh he just wanted to bring comics that he could heckle in front of his employees so he would look funny and smart and everything and so i just did as best i could under the circumstances which was pretty bad and uh you know it, there was no laughter and then i brought my friend on uh i was like okay here's the other guy <laughs> I just, I just went and hid in the hallway near the bathroom, and just stood there, uh, just uh, playing games on my phone, just for while well, my friend I think he did forty minutes or something, and uh, it was it was horrible. It was really horrible. <laughs> it was really, really embarrassing. That's, I think that's still the strongest contender for worst show. I remember wow. that. Bit. How um how long of a set did you do? Do you remember? I think I was supposed to do 20 minutes and I did four. <laughs> no, I, did longer. I, did longer. I did longer than four. I think I ended up doing 12 minutes, but you know, I, I wasn't feeling it. They weren't feeling it for sure. So probably a little bit under my time, but it was an extraordinary circumstance. So for people who don't do stand up comedy and are listening, can you explain a little bit of what goes through your brain uh, as that's all that stuff is happening? When you tell a joke and it doesn't work in front of a large group of people, to me, it feels like the air just gets just sucked out of your chest and you're just this airless husk standing in front of everybody. And it feels like it's like your skin. You can feel your like your cheeks turning to like porcelain, almost like freezing. It's like all your face loses all feeling. You can hear everything so exquisitely just the and um, it's yeah, it's a horrible. I mean, it's a horrible. It's a horrible feeling. It's really horrible. It's. But but the the nice thing is the next day you get up and you realize oh my, everything's my you know my arms and legs are in the same place and everything and you sur <laughs> you survived it. It does definitely toughen you up and I don't dwell on embarrassment nearly as much as I used to. Um, it happens and you get through it, but it's a terrible, terrible feeling. Oh, it's so true. You, you hear everything. You hear the little, <coughs> <coughs> Oh yeah. Or, <laughs> the you'll hear like, 
<laughs> oh, sorry, Greg. Do you hear like the no. noise in the kitchen or? Yeah, you can hear a blender starting up because you know someone makes a margarita. And it's... <laughs> Uh, the worst heckle, one of the worst heckles I've ever gotten. <laughs> wasn't even really a heckle, but I told this joke and, uh, it, you know, there was like about one or one and a half, two seconds of silence. And then this lady just went, what? <laughs> that, was, <laughs> that was the most cutting in one syllable. She managed to destroy me. We just, you know, it was horrible, <laughs> yeah. but you learned to laugh about it. Oh, absolutely. It, yeah, you learn that you go, okay, I'll be fine. Like, this is the worst thing that can happen. And uh, how do you um, how do you normally deal with hecklers? I, I, I am not the best at dealing with hecklers. I'll be the first to admit it. Um, I get very protective of my material, sometimes too sensitive, you know. Um, uh, yeah, I'm still I'm still working on that. I've, you know, I've been heckled. I've managed to hold my own and keep going with the show and everything. I'm not a technician like some people are where they can talk to the person and just like just seamlessly move into their next bit while talking to the heckler. So that's kind of something I need I need to I need to work on. Mm -hmm. um, you have to acknowledge it, obviously, because if actually sometimes if it's not loud enough, sometimes I will just ignore it. If someone right. in the front is just like uh, 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 and I think well, okay, stopping the show and talking to this one person is not worth it because most people did not hear it. So then I'll just ignore it. If it's obviously something where, you know, there's a moment of silence and someone yells something, you have to say something. You just have to talk to them. And usually the audience, well, what I found is the audience is on your side anyways, because they realize that they're the audience and you're the comedian. So just talking to the person will usually be funny to them because you're going off script and obviously and talking to someone and that's exciting to them, I think. So, yeah. Acknowledging it if it's loud enough for everyone to hear is would obviously be something that you have to do, I think. And uh, beyond that, I, I really don't know. I have to figure it out, <laughs> you know. Yeah, Some people are so good at it. I know it's amazing to me. I I I, um, I I'll tend I try to think that my my act and the way I perform doesn't generally allow for hecklers because it's mm -hmm. you know it's kind of a upper tempo and it's just this train that kind of keeps moving. But um, if somebody says something, uh, even if I hear it or not, I'll just do like a whatever, just like, oh, thanks, dad, or whatever. If it's a guy, if it's a woman, thanks, mom, just something sure. or, you know, that's my wife or, you know, just something stupid and quick. And then I just like keep moving on. Mm -hmm. um, I, I generally try not to get into the whole weeds of like, what did you say to me, sir? Like I, because that's just not my my strength or my forte. So I just kind of sure. go, you know, uh, you know, just pick something. It's, oh, here's the, here's the mayor or here's the whatever. And yeah, uh, you guys are very friendly. Thank you. You know, and yeah. I just kind of move on. So yeah, it's, it sounds like we're probably kind of, we have the same kind of philosophy towards it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I, the, the less I talk to people in the it. audience, the better. <laughs> that's, yeah. That's I feel the same way. Well, like, you know, uh, uh, Brian Regan, Brian, Brian Regan is my hero and he doesn't really talk to the crowd at all. He, he has, you know, he has dealt with hecklers and everything, but right. you can tell, you can tell it's not what he thrives on the way some comics do, you know? Um, so I, I would kind of put myself in that camp. I don't really, I don't like being heckled. I don't, I don't thrive on it. I don't think I'm yeah. particularly good at shutting people down or, or dealing with it, but I, I do what I can. Yeah, I, I've never been a fan of that. I, I like keeping the the ball of focus, as I like to say, because once you throw it in the audience, you just have to hope you get it back. Yeah, totally. But, I mean, there are some times when someone's just really drunk or belligerent or whatever, and you, like you said, you have to acknowledge it. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I always try to address it with kindness. Mm -hmm. uh, and then just move on and because you want to make sure that the, the crowd likes you more than the, you know, than the, the heckler. Cause I've seen, uh, <laughs> there was this one comedian who didn't matter if he was in minute one or minute, you know, 50, if someone said anything, he would just be like, turn and snap and yell at them. Yeah. And just be like, Shut up. And you know, I don't go to you, you know, and just went right at them. 
and the audience would be like, wow, what a jerk, you know, like, especially if it's early on. Mm-hmm. And it was the audience. So it was just, yeah. I've always kind of been like, all right, make sure that they're on your side first. <laughs> so Yeah, the, the punishment should fit the crime. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Someone just goes, woo! And you're yeah. like, sure? They start <laughs> freaking out. Then exactly. Probably, probably not the best approach. So uh, we talked about your Christmas party at a person's house. Is that the weirdest place that you performed? That probably is the weirdest as well. Yeah, I mean, you you, you know what it's like when you're just start you're starting out or even just doing, just just being a comic in a city. You do you know shows in bagel restaurants and things like that, <laughs> weird little bars and lounges and things like that. But um, that can also that can be really awesome sometimes. Sometimes taking things out of a comfort zone is is uh, is really rich territory. Yeah, and I've had some of the best show. So I feel like some of the best sets I've had have been without a mic, where ever that shows where the mic is broken and the people have to just use their voice or whatever. And sometimes that's awesome. It's, mm. It makes people really listen, you know. Right. I enjoy I I enjoy performing somewhere I've never performed before in like a weird scenario. Like I always enjoy that and I always try to say yes to it, even though I know most likely it's going to be terrible. <laughs> uh, you know, there are certain things uh, like this. Was it this year? Yeah, it was this year before uh, COVID. I did a, a show in an airport and, and it was in an uh-huh. airport food court. And wow. so taking the gig, you just know this is going to be terrible. But it was like, I wanted that that ability to be like, yeah, I did a show in an airport food court, <laughs> you know. Wow. And airport it was, food court, and it was just as bad as you can imagine. Um, I, as yeah, you, I've you never heard of it. Yeah, That's neither crazy. have these people, <laughs> and neither yeah. have the audience. <laughs> so, well, a lot of them, I would, a lot of them, I would imagine, were travelers, and some probably yes. didn't speak English and. Uh, yes, that is correct. We were near the international <laughs> airport, uh, the international terminal. So we had a lot of people who didn't speak English. Oh and my you, had, you had people just on a layover, just getting their food, eating and, and leaving or catching a flight. And so the crowd was always like every five minutes would shift. And so uh, if you tried to do material that was based on other things, it didn't go well. And it, it didn't go well for anybody. Uh, it, it was That's so bad. Crazy. I took out my phone on stage and like <laughs> recorded and no one cared because nobody was listening. Uh, yeah. but in hindsight, that would have been a wonderful opportunity to work on crowd work. Um, yeah, exactly. And so they said, we're going to do this again. You know, that was the funny thing. The, the people at the airport were like, this was great. We're going to do this again. And so I was like, I'll do it again. I'll work on crowd work next time. You know, it's so you, yeah, you just yeah, kind yeah. of learn and go, okay, maybe I could, you know, work on, on some different skills, but yeah, there are all sorts of these terrible shows that you just go, I want to do it. You know, that puts you in an interesting position because I don't know, I don't know if this is the same thing in, in the States, but in Canada, when you get, when you're going through customs, they have a, a sign up that says no jokes. It actually says, that. Yep. <laughs> so you're performing probably not that far from an area where legally you were not allowed to tell jokes. Yeah, the they ours are a little more specific. No jokes about bombs or weapons or oh, okay. things of that. You know, ours they're not going to no you go knock knock. You know, they're not. Yeah, <laughs> they're yeah, not yeah, gonna, yeah. not going to come over and you know put the glove on and. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that was that was a very weird experience, and you know, I've I've done uh, like a, a, a nudist resort. I've done a sweet sixteen birthday party. I've done like all these. Uh, a teen beauty contest, like all these bizarre things that I'm like, there's no reason I should be here. <laughs> you know? Did you, were you, did you have to be nude to do the nudist no. colony? No. no. Okay. Yeah. Thankfully I, uh, I, I jump around too much. I was a bit too, so. I was a bit too excited to ask that. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's okay. One, uh, one comic uh, was like, well, you know, thought he would be cool and flash the crowd. And they were like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Everybody else is is uh is is naked, and um, it's kind of the thing about a nudist resort is uh, at least in this particular one, it's never the people that you would kind of hope to see. Um, that's uh, that's, <laughs> that's you know that's it's so yeah, and so the audience you have people with knees in different time zones and just 
Um, so you, you just yeah. try. I, was, I just tried to like play to the wall above everybody. Uh, or I, I make the joke now of you know I take that old advice. Just imagine everyone in their underwear. Uh, yeah. so, <laughs> you're more comfortable. That's but funny. it was. Yeah, it was it was it was bizarre. It was a, a definitely a bizarre show, but it was it was fun. I mean, it was money. So yeah, it's an experience, man. It's a story. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And I love I love having something like that that you can just share and just go. Well, I I did this and this was really bizarre. So mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> so we are uh, we are talking right now with uh, Harris Anderson, a comedian and actor, and uh, very very funny. You can follow him uh, on social media. You can follow him on Instagram at the Harris Anderson, and you can follow him on Twitter at Hello Harris, which is H U L L O Harris H A R R I S. Um, now Harris, uh, you, so now you're you're kind of like a vet now in, in the game, and uh, we talked a little bit about advice. But do you have any additional advice, or or what are some of the mistakes that you see uh, a lot of new comedians making? I'm very cautious about, I think I mentioned before, I'm very cautious about giving yep. advice to, to people because I don't, the last thing I want to do is talk someone out of pursuing a certain style. I've, I've heard of it happening, uh, mm-hmm. you know, when people that are young, kind of young in the game and then someone comes up and says, why are you doing that kind of humor? Why are you, why are you working? Why are you working blue? Why are you working dark? Why are you doing political stuff? You should do something else. And then right. they do it and it's, it's not as effective ultimately as if they just pursued what they wanted to do or come into that naturally. So I don't want to ever do that to a person. Right. Um, from a practical standpoint, I would say that in the it, uh, in the beginning, it, you sh- your time is kind of precious, so use it well, have a plan. It used to kill me when I would be, you know, at open mics and it was one in the morning and someone had waited till, you know, three hours to get on stage or something, they would get on stage. And within 30 seconds, they'd be saying like, oh, what should I talk about now? Or just kind of like talking to the, it's like, you've been here for three hours and you don't know what you're going to talk about. I would say always have, always have a plan for, for what you're going to do in those early days. Um, even if you're, even if you say, I'm going to, I'm going to do loose stuff. To, if that's your plan, then go for it. If you say, I'm going to work on crowd work tonight and I'm just going to try to talk to people in the crowd or just kind of get used to being without a net that's fine or but if you you know have material like don't don't bail on that and start saying what should i talk about halfway through it i would say that Uh, you know have a plan of what you're going to do i would say before i went on stage at open mics because i'd been you know i'd been there for like four hours and i had to work the next day right and i had five you know five (laughs) minutes so i thought well this is pretty precious time so I'm going to work on this. I'm going to try this tag with this bit again. I'm going to try this bit that I tried last week. And then I'm going to try using this closing bit as a, an opening bit this time and see if it works as an opener and a closer. So I would say have a, have a plan, even if, if it bails. And if, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. But just have a plan and, and, and try to use those, those precious five minutes in the, in the beginning very, very wisely. Don't, my uncle told me when I worked for my uncle... He, I was, he was in construction. I was working construction with him. I was struggling with something. And he came up to me and said, don't work hard, work smart. And then he showed me a better way of doing it that required less effort. And that's always stuck, that's always stuck with me. When I see people churning through a bit that doesn't work for the 19th time or whatever, and they're just making it really hard on themselves, I think that that person is maybe not using their time as effectively as they could. Mm trying to develop a specific muscle, trying to work on a specific bit, trying to see if a certain tag works in a different room, et cetera, stuff like, stuff like that. We have uh, extremely similar uh, views on this. That is my number one piece of advice is have a goal when you go on stage. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That, that would infuriate me beyond belief uh, just to see someone go, now what do I want to talk about? Like get off the stage, just get off, get off my stage. I got stuff I want to do. You know, I don't yeah. want to stand here forever while you sit there and, you know, have no idea what you want to do. It's so, so true. You know, work on your oh. nervous tics, work on, your, like you said, your tags. Mm-hmm. So true. Yeah, even if you just want to say to this this set, I'm going to work on speaking clearly and loudly and clearly so that everyone can hear me. 
or exactly. like you said, working, working on your ticks or your physicality. I'm I'm gonna try holding the mic stand with the mic a different way or something like that. It doesn't have to be a big absolutely. thing. But just have yeah, something. Absolutely. I keep stepping on my punchline. I'm gonna not stumble over that word today. I'm going to sure. you know, I'm not gonna say um a lot or whatever whatever it is. Yeah. Absolutely. There's so many things, and that's regardless of how many people are in the audience or not. I think so many people get caught up trying to get laughs on open mics. Uh, mm -hmm. And I don't know how they are in Canada, but a lot of them here in the States are just comedians. Uh, as yeah. the audience. There, yeah. there are very few that have quote unquote normal people in the audience. And in that case, then I go, okay, let's see, you know, I'm a little more uh, concerned about laugh um, because I have a, a better judge and I'll do something that's proven so I can gauge it, you know, I'll do one proven joke. So I go, okay, here's where they're laughing on this proven joke. And now here's my new joke. And so I can gauge it based on the reaction I get, uh, mm -hmm. you know, kind of knowing where they are. But if it's all comics, it's like, all right, practice on auditioning for, uh, you know, America's Got Talent or a TV show because, you know, be yeah. comfortable with not getting laughter. Try that. Like make that something to work on. You know, there's all sorts of things. So, yeah, so no, I agree. Um, what is the, uh, what is the, the scene like in Vancouver actually? Well, it's, it, you know, I mean, it's sure, it's sure, uh, it's the same where you are. It's things are just kind of coming back. I mean, I'm not there. I'm actually not in Vancouver right now. I'm on Vancouver. Okay. I, I'm in Vancouver Island. I've been here for like, for like five months now, <laughs> just because things are definitely taking a hit there. Like the comedy club is not open. Um, it's, uh, you know, hopefully it comes back strong and people are able to get back into it and crowds start coming back you know i i don't know what is when that's going to be but before <laughs> before that <laughs> before the great pandemic there it was a good it was a good scene it was it was competitive it was um it was challenging vancouver audiences can be tough nuts to crack you know they kind of tend to vary and turn vary from from different parts of town, it's different audiences, probably a bit on the reserved side, but mm. I think I think it's a good proving ground. Mm. Um, is there a, uh, a perception that um, either you or uh, Canadian audiences or, or Canadian comedians have of uh, U.S. comedians? Perception of U.S. comedians? <laughs> I think... Uh, not really. I, I don't, not that I'm aware of. I mean, I think kind of Canadian comics, I mean, when, there's kind of a brotherhood that exists between comics, I feel, that right. kind of transcends borders and it's just kind of, it's like, oh, another comic, you know, who happens to be from the US. Uh, I don't, if, if audiences have a different perception of them, I'm not sure what it is. Um, I think American com comedians, from what I've seen, tend to be more confident. They tend to be a little more assured of themselves, which is a good thing. Uh, that I think, and it's I think it's the same with Canadian actors as uh, as well. I've heard that American actors are much more assertive in the audition room than Canadian actors. Canadian actors tend to be a little more apologetic and eager to please, which is not not necessarily the, a, a good quality to have. <laughs> So I would say, yeah, I would say that if there is a perception, it's amongst audience members that mm. the American comics are more confident, more willing to just say what's on their mind. And and Canadians, I think, tend to kind of tiptoe around things a little more. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, huh, that's very interesting. That's a... Uh... Yeah, I, I think there, part of it could be... Um considered arrogance, you know, like the, the Canadian, it's always like, oh, they always apologize for it. Oh, so sorry. And, you know, uh, all of that sort of stuff. But I think uh, at least in dealing with people from a business standpoint, there's there's humility and uh, being humble and being um, easy to work with is such a huge, huge um, bonus. Mm -hmm. uh, so many people just ignore that and they get this like diva mentality. Well, this is, you know, what yeah, I, this is what I do, and this is what I say, and this is how I. Yeah, act. yeah, that happens in Canada too. That definitely so, happens with with people. You know, I've seen people that have, you know, gotten a break or whatever, and they just turn into different people. 
which is which is sad to see. It's but yeah, I think that's that's showbiz. It can bring out the worst in people. I think. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Sometimes. Absolutely. Um, we're gonna. Um, uh, I'm gonna ask you about if you had any funny audience stories in a second. I don't know if you have any off the top of your head. Uh, so I'm going to give you a, a minute or so to kind of think about that. But right now right. we are uh, talking with Harris Anderson. He's a comedian and actor uh, up in Canada. Extremely funny and uh, just one of my favorite uh, comedians to, to listen to and, and to watch. And I'm excited to talk to him today. Uh, definitely check him out. You can follow uh, him on Instagram at the Harris Anderson. Uh, and on Twitter, you can uh, follow him at hello Harris, which is H U L L O Harris. Um, so, wondering uh do you have any weird uh or interesting audience stories whether that was you on stage or uh another comedian well, i'm trying to think of because <laughs> we all have like fights and you know but well maybe we don't all have fights but there, there are brawls that break out um you know there are people that yeah. stage there are, uh, yeah i've been pretty lucky with those things though honestly i I, oh, I was at one show where uh, it was a show that had been sponsored by this real estate company, and the real estate company showed up, and they were just the most disagreeable, rude, <laughs> entitled uh, collective that you've ever seen in your life. And they were just loud and heckling, and they were horrible. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember they had a cutout of themselves on stage, like a cardboard cutout, like, we sponsored the show. <laughs> we're ruining okay. it. And so uh, this is very uncharacteristic of me, but I was so annoyed. That I just grabbed the cutout during my set and just shoved it in front of their table. I said, you guys watch this because that's obviously all you're interested in is yourself. <laughs> and then I walked out on stage and just did my set too. This, this really nice table of people that actually wanted to see a comedy show. But that's very uncharacteristic of me. I normally don't do that sort of stuff. But then later on in the set, some one of them, uh, the, the headliner, made a joke about one of the ladies and the guy whipped a ketchup bottle at his head and uh, <laughs> thank, which, which, thank, which thankfully missed because uh, that would have wow. worked. And then they were, so they got, so I watched a sponsor, a group of sponsors get kicked out of their own show. That they had sponsored. <laughs> that was pretty interesting. I get to, get to see that again. <laughs> That's so bizarre. Why yeah, I it, never understood the, the logic of people who uh, go to a show uh, with just the intention to make it all about them or to heckle. Uh, I mean, bachelorette parties do this all the time, as, as you know, and it's just, if you ever want to depress a comedian, tell them the bachelorette party is in the audience. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, especially if they sponsor the show and then they just are loud and obnoxious and, uh, or the ones who pay 20, you know, $25 and just sit here, like make me laugh. And it's like, dude, yeah. You lighten up you're the one who paid the money like you laugh i get paid you don't laugh i get paid like yeah well also who would hire that comp who would hire one of those realtors <laughs> after <laughs> being at that show <laughs> like i'm so i'm selling the, the biggest investment i'll make in my life what about, what about <laughs> that fellow that was screaming at that young comedian during his set he seems like a <laughs> like a sensible good fellow, person right? to tour an empty house with. <laughs> yeah, come on, you moron, get with it. Unbelievable. If they just shoved the contract in your face. Sign it. Sign yeah. it. Ah. <laughs> That's so funny. Unbelievable. Uh, so let's talk a, a little bit about uh, you have a, an organization that you wanted to, to spotlight, and uh, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about uh, the Wilderness Committee. Yeah, the Wilderness uh, Committee is. Um, is a group that my, my mom actually alerted me about. My mom's been an environmental and uh, animal rights activist for uh, since before I was born and it continues to be so. And so I was uh, I was raised in a household that was, we were always taught about what was going on in terms of the environment and things like that. And uh, so my mom actually alerted me to this like, nonprofit group called the Wilderness Committee, which has been around since 1980. It's a nonprofit. Uh, it has its head office in Vancouver, and basically what they do is they're uh, committed to establishing protected areas of, of forest. Uh, they they pursue court cases to protect you know areas of forest and endangered species, things like that. They lobby politicians and put pressure on politicians to preserve uh, you know preserve areas of wilderness and, and educational 
programs for schools and things like that to to let uh, kids and people know about the importance of preserving uh, these these areas. Um, you know, it's a very it's a very sensitive issue in Canada because there are people that make their living in forestry, and um, it's you don't want to a lot of people when you when you talk about forestry and, and protecting forestry uh, they think people think oh well, you're trying to take away my job you're trying to take you know food from out of food from my table and things like that but it really it's just uh it's it's the short-sightedness i think of many of these logging companies in which they will just log they'll raise hectares and hectares of land uh just just to make a few bucks hmm. so i think it's uh it's, it's a very important uh charity and um you know i hope to support it in the future and um, i think they do great work that's awesome and uh, if people want to uh get involved and check it out they can go to www.wildernesscommittee.org uh you can also check them out on instagram and twitter at wilder w-i-l-d-e-r news any uh, N E W S that's wilderness org or, uh, at wilder news on Instagram and Twitter. I just want to say, uh, thank you again. I want to thank the, the viewers and the listeners for watching, uh, again, check out, uh, Harris Anderson on Instagram and Twitter at the Harris Anderson on Instagram and hello, Harris, H U L L O on, uh, hello, H U L L O Harris on Twitter. Uh, again, thank you so much for, for being here. It was uh, awesome to, to finally get to, to talk to you a little bit and uh, learn a bit a little bit about your uh, your story and, and uh, your thought process. And uh, I hope uh, this pandemic ends soon. We can all get back out and work. And I would love to, to do something with you, whether it's here in the States, up in Canada. Let's uh, let's get together and, and try to, to, to raise some money or, and uh, just do some shows together. So 